All right, so let's just go ahead and dive in because we want to hear as much as we possibly can from, uh, from our guest today. Uh, my name is Ann Ayers. I'm the Dean of the Colorado Women's College, and I am also the co-lead of the Community Plus Values Initiative here at the University of Denver, which has been such a treat for me to um, see all the different ways in which we can activate community together, uh, especially during this this really um, unique and unprecedented time. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, uh, I'm, I couldn't be more excited for both, not just our, our guests, but our interviewee. So this is, this is a really special morning. Um, we are, I think, just in such unprecedented times that uh, we thought about reaching out and finding a leader who has really weathered some, some interesting storms, uh, who comes from a background of having a DU, um, uh, DU degree. She has her, her uh, she has an MBA from Daniels. So that's really exciting. And, um, and just wanted to, to chat and kind of get some wisdom. So I'll tell you a little bit about Shannon. Um, she's currently the Senior Vice President and Chief People Officer at Crocs, um, which is obviously a progressive footwear company that's located here in Colorado. Um, and uh, she's also been at Western Union, uh, at Janus, at Level 3 Communications, at Accenture, and at DeVita. I think I have known you, Shannon, for at least five of those stops. I mean, we've known each other since for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and we had, I, I met Shannon sitting on the board of the Women's Vision Foundation, which then became the Leadership Investment. And we would go to these board meetings and Shannon would arrive at 7 a.m., um, more spry than anyone. Uh, it was always kind of amazing. And with a big gulp. <laughs> Do you have it? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> always full. And I was like, how does anyone drink, drink Diet Coke first thing in the morning? But whatever your juice is that powers you, it has been extraordinary. And she would sit down and we would be in the middle of something in the meeting and Shannon would say, I just have a quick question. And she would say something and it would just flip the way everybody was thinking about things and always for the better. So I, I'm just thrilled that you're here. Thank you for taking the time this morning. Um, and Anifa Musanjumana, thank you so much for being here as well. Um, Anifa is one of our Colorado Women's College leadership scholars. So again, thinking about leading through uncertain times, it just seemed like the right thing to have a leadership scholar, particularly doing this interview. So I'm so glad that you could take the time to be with us. Anifa, Anifa is a fourth year student at the University of Denver. She is um, uh, studying at Daniels also, so you both have that in common. And uh, concentrating in marketing um, and in leadership and hopes to, after graduation, be able to um, go into the cosmetics industry, which would be a great place for you to be. Uh, if you have some time after this, one of the fun facts about Anifa is that she has a YouTube channel um, where she does really fun YouTube videos that can always put a smile on my face. Um, so those are great. And she also co-founded the African Student Organization at the University of Denver um, and is coming back. I'm so glad that you didn't have to get pulled back, but um, you did spend winter quarter in London, I think, which is really cool. So thank you both for being here. The way this will work today is um, Anifa has some 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 uh, questions for Shannon, and they're just going to chat for a little bit. And I'm going to be monitoring the chat box over here the, the, um, where you're welcome to and encouraged to put some questions in. You can also do it through the Q&A function. And I'll jump back in at about 1140, and um, Shannon and I can banter a little bit as well about what those questions are. So with that, I'm going to pop off video and let you two go for it. Hi, Shannon. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I'm so excited to be interviewing you and honored. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, first of all, how are you doing today? How, just update us on how you're feeling. Yeah, how I'm feeling. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me today. And I think um, Anne was right in her opening comments when she said these are unprecedented times, right? And I think how am I doing is probably how many of you are doing, trying to figure out, you know, what does a new normal look like? How do we interact with each other and still manage to get things done and take care of one another? So I think it's been a very trying time um, for all of us, but I think, you know, I'm trying to take everything one day at a time and that's trying to keep things in, in perspective. So hopefully all of us are, are headed down that path. 
Thank you so much for um, updating us on that. The first question that I want to ask you about is your history with dealing with um, crisis situations. Um, you were at Level 3 Communication, now known as CenturyLink in 2001, at the time of the 9-11 attack and at Genuous Capital during the 2008 recession. So you've been through quite some major challenging times in your professional experience, um, right? I have. Unfortunately, I have. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So can you tell us what those times were like for you? What kind of leadership did you see that you tried to avoid? And what are some other kind of leadership that did you see that you tried to emulate? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great place to start, right? I've been out in the working world for about 25 years now, and it feels like, you know, every five to 10 years, you run into a major crisis um, that maybe looks and feels different, but I think there's learnings that come out of each of those situations. And the first one that you alluded to was 9-11. And unfortunately, on that day, I found myself um, in New York City and, and watched the planes going into the buildings um, and was standing right there when all that happened. And, you know, that definitely gives you perspective, right? And, and a sense of, oh my goodness, what just happened? What do we do next? Is everyone okay? And on that day, like today, many people are not okay. Um, but when I reflect on times like that, you know, I look even specifically at that day on 9-11, I was fortunate to be with 14 men who um, were in a class I was teaching. Most of them had military backgrounds. And what I really appreciated, and probably how I survived that day, literally, um, was their leadership. They were very quick to come together, identify a leader, um, communicate very clearly. We took very swift and direct actions. And it's some of those choices that, that ultimately got us out of harm's way. And I think, you know, staying calm, identifying leaders, you know, be, make, taking swift actions, I think in the moments of crisis, and maybe that's a very finite period of time, or maybe it's a, a longer period of time like we're dealing with now, I think some of those leadership lessons um, still pertain to us today. And you also referenced um, the 2008 recession, where I found myself leading HR for Janus Capital Group, now Janus Henderson, um, as the chief um, human resources officer. And you know that was a time when there was a lot of financial crisis, and we were trying to find ways to keep companies solvent. There was a backlash against the financial services industry, um, and there were also significant people cuts that we had to do um, to try to keep up with that economic recession. And some of the leadership lessons I took from that were, you know, once again, you have to take swift action, really understand what's going on around you. What do you need to do to act swiftly? Um, and then I think the other one that really came through in that um, time period was how to have transparent communications, right? How do you tell people, this is the, these are the circumstances we're facing. These are the actions we have to take. Here's what these mean to you. And um, you know we will get through this, but it's going to be a journey and it's not gonna get fixed overnight. And I think we're facing similar circumstances um, in this crisis as well. So I guess uh, we'll continue. I think that you, you continue getting lessons until you learn them, right? And so I think we'll continue to have these learning opportunities come our way. Thank you so much for being um, so candid about, you know, a very crazy time in your professional experience. Um, now I kind of want to uh, talk about the current situation that we're experiencing. You are the chief officer of people at Crocs, a company with 5,000 employees. How are you keeping them safe right now? And how are you keeping them valued? Yeah, it's a really important question and something that quite honestly is hard to do, right? Crocs is a progressive fun footwear company that hopefully many of you have heard of. Um, we have employees in 22 countries, but we do business in you know almost 100 countries. And so when I think about that workforce, while we've got you know our actual employees, we have a much broader group of people that actually um, you know create our our shoes that we um, sell that distribute those and some of those um, are not at our own stores and i think we've really been fighting this since the very beginning of the year um, as china started to take on this virus and those were the first stores to close it closed our you know our manufacturing and all that um, i think once again we've had to take very swift action to you know try to keep our employees safe 
and also try to keep the, the company solvent and doing well. And I think when we think back to what we've done, you know, first of all, we've leveraged stay at home where appropriate, right? If we have workers that can stay at home, we've allowed them to do that. But we've also, you know, had to figure out how do you continue manufacturing in a safe way? And we've taken some breaks at that. Um, what do you do about closing retail stores? And how do you still have a distribution center that's providing um, e-commerce services around the globe? How do you have those distribution services which um, are continuing to run? How do you create a safe environment? And I think, you know, the good news is we have gotten great coaching and, and counseling from a lot of our um, legal entities or governments all around the world, but the protocols quite honestly are different in each country and state that we operate. And so we've been very forthright in talking with our employees, you know, moving swiftly to get protective equipment, making sure we're temperature checking at the door, um, you know, sanitizing germ busters come in on a regular basis. There's a lot we're doing to keep people safe and we will continue to do. And then we're also, you know, really talking with our workforce to say, if you have circumstances that we need to understand and try to accommodate, um, we're trying to find ways to do that as well. So it's, um, it's a lot of actions by a lot of people to try to support a very diverse workforce all over the globe. Okay, um, thank you for sharing that. Um, you talk about having to make difficult decisions during 9-11 and the 2001, I mean 2008 recession. Um, can you talk about some of the difficult decisions um, that you've had to make in the past few weeks? Yes, I feel like the last few weeks have had a lot of difficult decisions. I think probably the hardest decisions that we've had to make are, um, you know, we run retail stores all over the globe and we have had to close those retail stores in accordance with government guidelines, but also to keep people safe. And, and with those closures have come furloughs of our employees. And it is really difficult to send people home for a period of time. And while we've been able to um, continue their benefits, we have had to um, stop paying them for a time being when they're not coming into work. And I think that's a really difficult decision. We've tried to handle it with dignity and grace and transparent communication, but I know, you know, it's hard for those individuals. Our hearts go out to those people and we've tried to remain in communication with them. And we're very hopeful that they're back at work this summer um, selling you our clogs and sandals with their smiley sunshine faces. And, um, but those are the type of decisions that business leaders are having to make today. Um, you've seen that in multiple industries and um, it's important to make swift decisions, but it's important to do it in a caring way. Okay. Um, so in a matter of three months, billions of people across the globe have fundamentally changed the way they work and live. It's kind of amazing how strong and adaptable that we all are. Um, what are these changes to everyday, what of these changes to everyday personal and work life do you hope to stay um, and become a part of the new normal? Yeah, first of all, I'm super proud of just everyone in our society for so quickly adapting to a new way of being, right? And mm -hmm. having virtual communication and, you know, different social distancing standards. And I've just been really impressed for the most part that people are doing the right thing and they're taking this on. You know, as an HR professional, one of the things I'm actually excited about and that I am hopeful will continue as we move forward is um, two things. One, the fact that we can see that, you know, people can continue to be very productive in a virtual world, right? We are seeing more discretionary effort from our workforce than I've seen ever. And they're all doing it from their living rooms and kitchens and, and offices, right, at home. And yet they're finding ways to get work done, to collaborate, to communicate. And I think that's great. So I'm really hoping that um, our openness to virtual work continues in our new normal. The other thing that I'm actually excited about is that because this crisis really has impacted so many people and people have had to take their work home, I think we are finally starting to blur the lines between personal and professional. And you know, we are starting to recognize that people have families, people have kids, people, you know, have different environments they go home to. And you know, I can't tell you how many calls I've been on where a little kid runs in the room and is crying or has a toy or has to get something that they printed out for school in the background. And I'm really excited about that because I think that we all show up as human beings to work. And 
I think for a long time, and especially in the corporate world, we've had this distinction between you're someone at work and you're someone at home. And really, you're just one person that has a pretty complex life. And I think if we can start to understand that better of people, I think we can ultimately support people better. So I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of blending personal and professional in an appropriate way where we can really um, support each other as human beings. Um, yeah, I actually agree with you on that one as well. Um, I'm excited to see if like more companies will be willing to move more work um, at home. And I'm excited to see like more companies give empathy towards people um, going through difficult situations. Um, with that being said, I wanted to talk about some of the things that COVID-19 is shedding an even brighter light on, such as the social injustices and inequities we live with. Um, and when I talk about inequities, um, I'm talking about like gender and um, healthcare. For example, the higher income you make, the more healthy you are. And something that's actually really heartbreaking um, is when it comes to race. The African American community accounts for 41% of COVID-19 deaths in Michigan, even though they represent only 14% of residents. This is something that's happening in Chicago and Louisiana as well. Um, we also see like on an economic level, the disparity between professionals and service-based workers. And there's so many examples of things that we're starting to see clearly. Um, with that being said, do you think because we see an inequity so clearly right now, the COVID experience could propel equity and that we could see meaningful change on this front in a post-COVID world? Yeah, well, I certainly am hopeful, right? I think you raised some really good points. Um, I think one of the things that's coming through quite clearly on the television when you turn it on every morning and night is the fact that so many people are being impacted by this. And it really is impacting everyone and some groups disproportionately, right? And I think that you're starting to see, you know, people line up for food, people line up for medical services. And I think this is, hopefully this will be an opportunity for society to come together and say, look, irrespective of our differences, we're all human beings and we all deserve, you know, rich and fulfilling lives in the fact of love and caring and medical care and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see that people are trying to give in different ways, even if that's going out at 8 p.m. I know that happened in our neighborhood last night and, you know, are, are clapping for all the, the medical workers that are making their way to the front lines um, or people that are giving extra coupons and tips to the grocery store workers that are making sure that you have food on your table. So, you know, I do think these inequities are showing up more and more, but I also am hopeful based on the moments of kindness we've seen from all different types of people from all different walks of lives and how they're coming together. So um, I think you can, you can look at the situation and say we've been handed a lot of lemons, but I think it's our responsibility to take those lemons and make them the best tasting lemonade we can and to distribute that to everyone. I love that last part about the lemons. Um, hopefully we do take this situation and implement you know, better change. Um, with that being said, I was actually looking on the Crocs um, website uh -huh. and I noticed that um, the board and top level management has many more men than women. Um, and in my leadership um, scholars program, we often talk about emotional intelligence as a really important aspect in leadership and that we often see women are either better at this or take on the emotional part of leadership work. And I was actually doing a bit more research on this because I was intrigued. And I found a study done by Corin Ferry, which developed 12 proficiencies of emotional intelligence, which include awareness, uh, emotional awareness, empathy, organizational awareness, influence, and teamwork, et cetera. Um, the study actually tested 50,000 professionals across 90 countries, and they found that women scored higher on 11 out of 12 elements, showing that women are more emotionally intelli intelligent than men. Um, with that being said, do you find that happens to you at your work at Crocs or other companies that you've worked at, at that you have to handle the emotional um, part of like the job of your leadership positions? Yeah, 
It's a great question. And, you know, as I look back on my career, I've worked in very male dominated careers um, and industries. And, um, and I'm fortunate actually to work now at Crocs where two thirds of our workforce are actually women. And at our senior levels, our chief financial officer is female, our head of our largest regions female, our chief operating officer who's newly hired is female, our head of product and merch is female, I'm female. So I starting to feel like a really good balance. And for the first time in my career, the pronoun most typically used is she or her, or what can we do to support her as our, as our um, target customer. And I do think that that's important, but I, I do go back to believing that men and women really do need to work together to be successful as an organization. And you, know, you can see emotional intelligence in both men and women, but I think in these times, we need everyone to put even more emphasis on those skills. And um, you're seeing some do that better than others. Sometimes they're females, sometimes they're amazing male leaders. I'm fortunate to work for our CEO, Andrew Reese, um, who's a, a tremendous leader and is staying calm, cool, collected, and very focused on getting us through um, you know, this crisis. And I really appreciate his leadership. So I think you know, it's something to, to watch um, and, and continue to monitor, but I, I think everyone can dial up their emotional intelligence in this time period. I agree as well. Um, and my next question for you is I'm currently um, looking for a job and something that I'm looking at when I'm, you know, searching for the jobs are how companies are responding to this situation. And I'm very interested in seeing whether companies are treating employees, consumers and shareholders with equal respect. And I know this is something that like the business roundtable talked about this year, like making sure that there's an equal treatment across all levels. And with that, I just wanted to ask you what happens to corporate social responsibilities when companies are in crisis and making budget cuts? What can we expect to see? Yeah, I think corporate social responsibility is something I've been passionate about for a long time um, and think is extremely important. And I think, you know, what you're going to see is, is companies handle this in different ways. There's going to be some companies that dial down their corporate social responsibility um, efforts, and that's really unfortunate. You're going to see some companies that say doing good right now, good for society, is going to be even more important. And I know that's something at Crocs. We've actually dialed up our efforts in corporate social responsibility recently. You know, we've started providing anywhere from 10 to 20,000 pairs of Crocs to our healthcare workers free every day. Uh, we've been providing 10 to 20,000 pairs of shoes to the frontline workers, and that's because they're easy to clean and they need them in the hospitals. And um, we've been excited to do that. And and it's also, you know, it's, I think it's doing the right thing for society. It's also making sure we continue to stay relevant in this time period. And, and so, and it's a way to really connect with our consumers. And now we're starting to even give our consumers an opportunity to help us with providing um, shoes to our frontline workers and, and join us in that fight. So, you know, I think companies will make different decisions. I'm proud to work in an organization that's making the right decision in my perspective to support um, you know, our communities in which we serve, um, but it will be, CSR will be an interesting topic to monitor over the next 12 to 24 months to see the impact to the nonprofits, to the communities in which we live, and, and I hope people continue to do the right thing. I agree with you as well. Um, and this next question is a little bit personal, but I still wanted to ask it. Um, so what advice would you give for students entering the job market right now? And how does this change right now, given the COVID situation? Yes, I don't envy all of you coming out of school right now, because to be transparent, I think it's a hard time, right? I think it's a hard time to join the job market, and yet we need you, right? And I think we need for students coming out of school right now to be really agile. And what I mean by that is we need people that can roll up their sleeves, do what we need to do, and we're all doing that right now. So that perfect career that you said, this is my first job, I'm gonna do it for two or three years, then I'm gonna move to that job. You know what, just start somewhere. Start by going into an organization in whatever capacity you can. That might be volunteering, that might be your first internship, that might be a full-time job. But really, whatever you do, give it 100%. Roll up your sleeves. Be willing to help with whatever. It's those formative years that you learn the most. I started my career in consulting. And you know, I cannot not tell you how many presentations I did for the partners. And you know what? There's a difference between the people that just 
typed the presentations and the ones that actually, you know, really read them and understood the business rationale behind them and made sure they came out looking right. And, and, you know, while, while I was, all my job was to do was to type, I was learning as much as I could in those moments. And I think this is going to be a time where people are going to have to be more flexible and more willing to try new things. And you might not start in your dream job, but if you work hard and you demonstrate that you can be a key contributor, you'll ultimately get to your dream job. Thank you so much for that thoughtful, thoughtful um, answer. That's actually something that I've been thinking about a lot, like being adaptable to different job industries and um, different job fields. Um, now that we've covered some of the uh, more serious things, I wanted to talk about um, some of like uh, the more personal things for you. Um, this is a very serious question before we get into all that. Um, what are the right type of shoes for a global pandemic? <laughs> well, I have to say Crocs, right? I mean, I do work for Crocs. I think actually we are actually finding that Crocs are great for right now because they are easy on, easy off, and they're easy washable. So not only that, they're super fun to wear, they're comfortable, and you can also personalize them with all of our fun gibbets and charms. So um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't put a shameful plug in for Crocs right now. So Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, I've also heard that people at Crocs pretty much wear Crocs all the time. Um, could you describe your favorite Crocs or do you even have them on handy? Oh, I, I, well, it is true. I would say 99% of our um, Crocs employees literally wear Crocs every day to work. And probably if you found them outside of the office, they're going to have them on as well. So um, let me, I'll pull off. I have them on now. So hang on one second. So, okay. So the Crocs I'm wearing today are, uh, I'm wearing our new Brooklyn. This is my. Those are actually so cute. Those are so cute. I know these are our new Brooklyn uh, sandals. They have our light ride platform tech and comfort technology. So loving these, but um, I will tell you, we've seen amazing videos from all of our fans with their quarantine Crocs and they're on TikTok and Instagram and people are just having a great time, um, you know, decorating them differently with their gibbets and at least trying to put a little levity and fun into their day. So um, I'm excited about that, so. Yeah, I've watched um, some of the Instagram uh, videos on Crocs um, Instagram and they're pretty fun to watch. They are. They're, I'm always amazed what people do with them. I'm like, oh yeah. my goodness. So yes. Okay. Um, so the final question that I have for you is, I know that you are a wife and a mom of three. For many of us, our, profess our personal and professional lives have been conflated. Um, for example, I'm doing this interview from um, my apartment at DU. Um, how have you managed this with your family and work life? Yeah, well, it's uh, it's quite interesting times, right? All of a sudden, we've had work life and family life completely converge. Um, I'm fortunate to have a 19, 10, and 7-year-old, a husband that's jumping in, and also a great nanny at our house. And we have just had to find new ways and new roles and responsibilities. It's I, I will say I never thought we'd be in a situation where we're basically homeschooling, and yet we are. And we're trying to add structure to our day and who does what and you know, get some fun in there, get some exercise, um, but also make sure that we're getting all of our tasks done. And also, you know, I think trying to respect boundaries too, right? If this person's working on this or this person's, you know, has to be on a meeting, how can you find a space, even if it's tucked away in a corner somewhere where um, people can, can do what they need to do? And so I think it's taking a lot of patience. Um, I have to say that um, I would be lying if I didn't say I'm excited to get back out to the real world. Um, but I also think you can look at this moment and say, you know, it's an opportunity to have a lot more family time than typically you would. And, and that also can be a blessing. So I agree with you and learn some new skills as well. Yes, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, um, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I'm going to go ahead and invite Anne um, to come back. Great. Thank you, Anifa. Hi, and I, and if I hope you'll stay on too, because sometimes it's um it's fun to just get both perspectives and keep the conversation going. Um, I was just on a on a, a leadership team meeting actually with lots of the leaders across DU uh, this morning, Shannon, and a question came up that I wanted to just kind of throw at you too, which is, this is causing us um, uh, because of the the speed of things and because of the fact that we're not really in person with folks. Um, we're having to plan in public. So we're running drafts by people um, for things that are 
kind of half baked and um, and so it causes transparency, which in some ways is really great for people and in some ways can be additionally unsettling. So are you seeing that happen and kind of how do you balance when you need to be really transparent by the nature of things, but you also are totally buttoned up? Yeah. I, I think actually, I mean, I've always been a big proponent of trying to be as transparent as, you're, as you possibly can. And I think one of the things that we're having to do that I think many organizations are having to do right now is look at a lot of different scenarios and plan for a lot of things that have not happened, I hope will never happen, um, but that we have to be ready if they do happen. And I think that is causing us to have conversations with people that we typically wouldn't have. Um, to say, you know, what if this did last six months? What would we do? What if this, you know, what if this continues to devastate the economy for another two plus years? What does that look like? And so I think we've really tried to just talk candidly with people and say, you know, we are preparing a lot of different scenarios and we need you to be part of those. And that's going to enhance our readiness. And, and I hope that we never have to do that work. But I think bringing people along is helping. And I know at our own organization, we went into this with really strong engagement. Our engagement is typically in kind of the top 10% of companies. And I can see that discretionary effort. And I also can see that people are willing to go the extra mile and, and really go along on the journey with us. And they're willing to do things that they typically wouldn't have done. And in this scenario, they are. I think it's also okay to tell people, we don't know the answer. And this is our best answer today with the information we have. And it could com completely change tomorrow if we get different information. And that's something we have really tried to um, let people know as we're doing the best we can with the information we have now. Right. What, uh, what was your, um, I mean, you probably had several, but um, we've got a question that came in about, what was a message that you sent out to your senior leadership team as, as COVID was um, kind of coming into full force? How did you communicate with them? How are you communicating with them? Um, yeah, so I think the first message is all hands on deck, right? right? <laughs> this is a time for everyone to roll up their sleeves and everyone to get involved. Um, we actually meet as a senior leadership team. Our C-suite meets three times a, a week right now. Um, everyone on the call. And I think that that level of communication is enhanced. Um, and I think it's super important. I think the other thing that we've done that I could share for others is we have put a framework around the defensive strategies that we're taking and also the offensive strategies that we're taking amidst this crisis. And I think it's important to play both roles, right? What are the things you need to do defensively to stop the bleeding, deal with what's coming at you, you know, really respond and get yourself to a quote, safe, you know, viable place. But then also, you know, offensively, what are you doing to prepare the organization for the future state, right? And, and how are we gonna come through this? And how are we gonna recover? And how do we continue to stay relevant? And how do we play offense? And, um, and I think both of those thinkings, if you just let yourself get into a defensive posture, I think the recovery looks quite difficult. Um, if you let yourself think about both, I think you start to also have some optimism about what the other side of this can look like. And you can feel a little more in control in a situation that you don't have a lot of control. So I think an offensive and defensive strategy is something you know, I would encourage all people to think about what does that mean for you as an individual and you as an organization. Yeah, that's great. When, when you think about uh, um, just being in the real retail industry, what do you think the long-term effects might be in terms of human behavior? Are we going to be leaning a little bit more? It's a, it's a you know, bricks and mortar versus e-commerce question um, yeah. that came in. Where do you think those behaviors yeah, are? Obviously, you know, we spend a lot of time studying that. Um, we have our own retail stores. We also wholesale to lots of other stores that you would go to, whether it's Famous Footwear, Dick's Sporting Goods, or any of those, right? Um, and then we have e-commerce channels, Crocs.com or Amazon, you can buy our shoes too. And, you know, we're definitely seeing a shift towards e-commerce right now um, because that's what's available. I think you'll continue to see um, our consumers um, trend towards that channel. And so we're preparing for that. But we also think people are going to continue to want some type of in-store experience. Um, but that will probably scale back slowly as we adjust to our new normal. And that's something that we're studying right now, what's happening in China. They've started to open their doors again, and we're watching how the consumer comes back there and what they're wanting, how they're interacting, 
you know, the times of day they're coming, things of that nature. So I think we're gonna have a new normal in the brick and mortar channel. And um, there's gonna be a lot to learn, but I think you're gonna have to provide an experience that's compelling for people to come together in, in the actual brick and mortar stores. And then you're gonna have some people that just can't wait to get out again and they just can't wait to get out <laughs> again. So that could happen too. So just depends. Anifa, I know you you love fashion and, and pay attention to all these things. I saw you nod when um, Shannon said there needs to be maybe some in-store experience. I'm just curious, what um, what do you see with, with your generation, with your fellow students in terms of um, uh, shopping patterns and habits and how might this affect them in your mind? Um, like Shannon said, I think um, we're gonna see more people go into like in-store, um, for like the for the shopping experience, just because we've all been indoor for such a long time that we're gonna want to experience that again. But at the same time, um, I like the point that she made about TikTok and like Instagram earlier. I think that a lot of companies are gonna have to like, you know, revamp their social media accounts just so that they can um, take advantage of, you know, like the new wave towards um, e-commerce shopping. Yeah. yeah. And we, we, did, um, we did a TikTok, um, million dollar Crocs with, um, it was based on a, a phrase that came out of Post Malone and we ended up getting, this is earlier um, last year or later last year. And literally we had like 2 billion views on TikTok with people doing, showing us their million dollar Crocs. And so I think there's just totally new ways to reach demographics, but I also think you have to have fun, right? And provide people those opportunities. And that's really important right now, you know, in these hard times, people want to have a little levity in their day, right? And I think we need to give them those moments. Yeah, for sure. Jana, let's dive back into the questions around just being in the job market. So um, someone has chimed in and said, you know, was in the job market before all of this mm -hmm. kind of hit um, in force and just how do you keep on keeping on um, and what are some ideas that, that you might have on that front? Yeah, and is this, are you speaking about someone that's like currently looking for a job yeah. or is it okay? Yeah, yeah. and um, it looks like um, someone um, in Seattle and it looks like somebody who's um, a pretty seasoned professional. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, you know, to be transparent again, it's a hard time to be looking for jobs right now. And I think, you know, I've always had this concept that sometimes in your career, you need an in the meantime job. And that might be a situation that we're in right now. People might not end up in their dream jobs for the next year or two. And that's okay. Take an in the meantime job where you can go and do your best and contribute the best way you possibly can and and really scope out what are the learning opportunities that I can get in these next couple of years um, in the meantime. And that doesn't mean we eventually, you know, won't get back to what we want to be doing in our dream job. But I think it just is once again, back to my point around agility and the need to be flexible right now and to have hope. And it's also going to be an opportunity to really connect more than you ever have with your network. And there are, and there are going to be many people out there that are looking for work right now. And there is no shame in calling and saying, Hey, I need help. Can you connect me to that person? Can you introduce me? Can you put in a good word? All of those things are appropriate behaviors. And I think other human beings, they want to help people. So don't look at that as your, you know, being a burden to someone. Actually, you might make their day by the fact that they can help you. And, right. and I think that's where the human spirit is really strong. And I'd love to see that continue to flourish right now. I would too. Um, we also have a question about the impact on the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, you know, we're, we're in a system, uh, certainly in the United States, where it's largely um, employer-sponsored, employer-based. Um, how do you think that might change as we, as we go through this? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we've actually been on the phone with our healthcare partners and our actuaries this week trying to understand what this looks like, right? And try to model out how this is going to play for the next couple of, of years. And I think what you're seeing is that right now, unless you're really ill, have COVID or have, you know, a really serious situation, people are trying to avoid the hospitals at all costs. And that might be appropriate right now as we take care of those really struggling and, and et cetera. I think one thing we have to consider though, is that we still all do need to do preventative health screenings. And I know this week um, I had an opportunity to see my doctor and she was on her video screen at home and I was also on my video screen at home and, and I had that thing. But what we're expecting is that people are putting off all elective medical procedures um, for most of this year. And what that's going to do is put a, put a big burden 
on the healthcare system next year to catch up and also treat things that were missed this year because people didn't do the preventative health screening. So to the, to the point that people have access, you know, this is a great time to use telemedicine, telemental health. I'm very concerned about mental health right now. There are things that you can do from a mental health perspective and they can just be on your phone. You don't even need a video camera. You can just talk with someone. And, and so I think this is gonna have a pretty monumental um, impact on the healthcare industry, but it also comes down to each of us doing the right things and, and trying to still take care of ourselves even during these difficult times. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, Anifa, I want to ask you a quick question in terms of mental health. I know that you're really active on social media uh, and through your YouTube channel and a little bit through, um, I think, Instagram as well. Is that outreach and that connection, is that helpful, do you think, from a mental health perspective? Um, is it rich enough? Um, I would say like um, it's semi helpful um, since the pandemic has um, started. We, I've seen like a lot of interactions and like different challenges and just a different uplifting activities that people are doing on social media. Um, like for example, during um, I think it was like the Women's Day, um, a lot of like different um, women were tagging each other and uplifting each other and telling each other that they're beautiful. So we are seeing that people are coming together, but at the same time, like when you turn off your phone and you're to yourself, like I think it really does hit you. And so I just hope that a lot, of, um, a lot more people become more open about their feelings with their family and friends. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, Shannon, another good one came in um, with lots. Uh, what, what do you think in terms of new business opportunities that this might present? And, you know, sort of as you think about, you mentioned playing defense and playing offense. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may just be right at the nascent stages of this, right? We're, still, we're all still sort of absorbing what's going on. But what have you identified as some new business opportunities? Yeah, I think, I mean, we are still at those nascent stages. But I think, first of all, you're going to see almost a retrenchment back to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Food, water, shelter, and just making sure that all those human needs are, are met. And so I think you're going to start to, to see that. The other thing that we've talked about um, that you, and we've studied is, you know, when you look at things like war times, right? Um, you start to see after war times, um, people found what they call like lipstick moments. And that meant, you know, you might not have a hundred dollars to go out and have a great experience or buy something super special, but maybe you have $10 where you can go buy a beautiful lipstick and wear that for the next month of a bright, happy color. And so I think we're going to have some, some lipstick moments coming out of this, like you would see in wartime. And, and I think that we can have fun with that and we can celebrate some of the small things. And so I think um, you're going to see smaller gestures, smaller items start to make their way back into our society as we just appreciate the small things. So um, that's one of the things that we're watching. Yeah. How do you, uh, I know well, I've been on a board with you, which has been really fun. And I know that you, you are on um, Girl Scouts. And yeah, Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. Any other ones right now? Um, I have time for a ton of University stuff as well, yep. Okay, and uh, so as a board member, how do you help broaden the thinking of the leaders that you're supporting and, and working with so that they can play this offense and that they, I almost say like turn on your, your feelers or your Velcro so that the new ideas stick to you and come to you. Um, yeah. it's, it's like having a whole new set of reflexes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm fortunate right now to serve on the Girl Scouts of Colorado board. We're actually going through a CEO, CEO search right now um, that we've had to be very agile about how do you search for a CEO while no one can get together. Um, but, you know, what, what I'm finding is that there's a lot of value um, and, you know, right now it's hard to find time for these things, but there's a lot of value our business leaders can provide um, the nonprofit world. And, you know, you're look, if I use Girl Scouts as an example, right, this is an organization that thankfully they got their cookie sales done before um, everyone went indoors and the girls wouldn't have been able to go out and sell cookies. Um, but another big revenue stream for them is the camps and, and kids coming together this summer. And, and we're not sure what that's going to look like this summer and, and what does that mean for them. So those same offensive defensive playbooks that I talked about earlier are just as relevant in nonprofits and, and bringing that mindset of staying calm, focused, decisive, you know, what are we going to do if this happens and scenario plan, I think is super relevant in the nonprofit world as well. So I think for, you know, those leaders that are playing both roles, um, we need to take lessons from both sides, for-profit, 
um, and not for profit and bring them to the table in a calm, measured way. That makes good sense. Um, Anipa, I, I'm going to ask you a question too that just came in. As a student leader, um, how do you think that the lessons that we're hearing today um, from Shannon could be reflected on campus by students and then also by uh, university leaders? What are the pieces that you're hearing that you would, you'd like to see us activate? Um, I really like the fact um, that Shannon made about everyone coming together and just seeing like unity between um, administrators, um, students, just like with, between everyone. And something that I've actually seen recently that's really cool is I've seen um, the USG student government um, come together and listen to some of the student demands, such as um, implementing a fail pass so students aren't too worried about the grades. And so like we're seeing action on the, you know, at, at DU on that level. And I think it's just like beautiful that we're able to kind of express ourselves with like the administrative leaders. And so, yeah, just like that communication between everyone is like very much needed at a time like this. Yeah, that's totally true. Um, all right, so uh, Shannon, talk about, we, we actually, I just was in this leadership call as I've mentioned a couple times, and we were talking about um, DU has had some things in place from a technical perspective that have really helped us move online quickly. There are also holes in that where we're, we're having to, to plug those holes with different softwares and things. Uh, but, but on par, we're, we're feeling really good about sort of some of this that we had in place. What have you had in place in terms of um, your, the, uh, the digital upskilling of your workforce that you had done previously? What are you doing going forward? Are you thinking about that stuff? Yeah. So I'm really, I think at Crocs, we're really fortunate that we've done a lot of work in the last two to three years to digitally upskill our workforce. And whether that was, you know, communication tools, like we're using Microsoft Teams all around the globe and everyone has a video camera and everyone's able to interact and share files and see each other visually. Um, that, thank goodness, because we just put that in six months ago. And that, I mean, has been a saving grace. I'm so thankful for that. But we also, you know, have things like virtual recognition programs and, you know, virtual learning where we're, we're teaching people how to do things by sharing videos that literally they're creating in their kitchens, but they're still showing like, if you're gonna go sell this shoe, this is what we want you to talk about. And this is what the soul's made of. And they're doing that education online and that's really working well. I think the other piece is, you know, we have automated, um, our, whether it's manufacturing or distribution centers. And so one of the things we did last year was um, built our new Ohio distribution center and it's a very automated facility. Um, and that's, you know, going well as well. But I think it also, when you, when you automate things, you have a little less flexibility. And one of the things we've had to think about is, okay, how do we still provide in an automated um, environment still the right social distancing and things of that right. nature. So we've had to kind of look at some of those practices that we put in place with different guidelines and really think about, you know, how do we have people date different shifts? How do we spread out the workers on the floor? How do we, you know, temperature check them on the way in? How do we clean equipment each time a new person's using it? And so while those automation things are really helpful, um, they also bring different challenges that we've had to learn. They're not quite as flexible and adaptable as um, right. non-automated things, right? You can't just move millions of dollars of equipment, right? Um, and so we've had to you know, be flexible with how we do that as well. So um, we're continuing to learn, and I think we will continue to uh, find ways to improve. But thankfully, we've got most people in our workforce connected and all over the globe, and that's going well. And I'm thankful we made that investment. Yeah. Uh, I know that equity is a is a passion that we share and um, and thinking deeply about how do you really behave inclusively. One of the challenges that we're finding at DU is that because we now have people spread out and they're all in very different environments, we're realizing that one of the ways that we provided it um, a more equitable experience for folks is because we control the physical environment. So we could provide in our um, Anderson Academic Commons technology or a quiet place to study. Um, we could provide in our dining halls um, the kind of nourishment that people need. And now that it's dispersed, we're trying to figure out as a, as a university, how do we support when you've got so many people in so many different environments? Um, have you had that challenge? Have you been thinking about it? Yeah, I, th I think we have had that challenge, maybe not as pronounced as you would see in the education sector or in the um, nonprofit sector, right? I look at 
you know, Girl Scouts and how they have people dispersed all over rural areas that don't have access to technology, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, there's still some practices you can do. Like, it's great that today we get to see each other on the video screen, but, you know, if I think we can also try to find the common denominator, right? If, if not everyone has the video screen, then make the whole call auditory, right? For everyone to do um, that. Or I think, I think we're gonna have to get creative about ways that we disperse things. I know I was really excited. My daughter last week um, went and actually sent a letter in the mail to someone and she's never really done much of that other than when she goes to camp, right? But she's like, oh, you know, I wanna get this message to this person. I don't think they, I can see them on their phone. So. You know, I also think it's a time to reflect on simplicity and how we can get back to basics and find that common denominator. And, and you never know that one card that you send might, might change someone's day. Isn't that true? It's funny. I find myself putting things out um, and, and it's forcing a whole new level of having to let go of the outcome because you, you send something or, and you just don't have that moment where you run into people um, in the hallways uh, and, and can kind of get that feedback. Um, there was a question that also came in for both of us, but I'm going to make I'm have you answer it first. I could just go ditto um, at the end. But um, so the question is, um, I want to get this exactly right. Um, what lessons from this pandemic do, um, do you think will incorporate into your hiring practices, um, specifically around traits and skills that you're going to be looking for in candidates? Um, yeah. I mean, the number one thing that comes to my mind is adaptability. People that are flexible, can be agile, can change what they need to do. And I think the other thing is hard work. People that are willing to do the right thing, roll up their sleeves, work at any level, and just have grit, right? Have grit right. to get through the things and get things done. And um, that's something that I think we've been hiring for for a while, but it's even more pronounced in this situation. Yeah. Uh, so I'll... I'll add that, uh, you know, I do think there's a difference between technical skills and technical leadership and adapt adaptable. And um, I've had a chance to talk to somebody in our executive um, leadership team over at Daniels about this. And I think it's really, it's key. What I'm curious about is how do we, so technical being, there's a, there's a specific skill set. It's like operating, right? Um, there's a really specific skill set and a specific outcome you're looking for. Whereas adaptive is, is, as you were saying, you just have to be able to um, react to situations that are more complex and evolving. Uh, so I think that that's real. I, I'm curious, how do you test for that in an interview, right? Yeah, like, I, mean, I think I go back to the age old phrase of the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, right? And I, I don't know if that's always true, but I do think you have to start interviewing people saying, tell me about a time when everything just kind of went to heck in a handbasket and you had to figure out what to do. What did you do? How did you react? What were your emotions? How did your team, you know, survive it? And, and ask them, right? And you'll find that most people will tell you the truth, right? And you can learn a lot from the behaviors that they demonstrate in those really trying and challenging times that, you know, either they had a really good learning of I would do this again, or I would, or I would never handle it that way again. But I think you have to look for those clues in people's history, and they don't always have to come from professional experiences, where you can say, okay, this person is going to most likely be resilient, they're going to be flexible, they're going to make their way through it, they're going to stay level headed. And, and you can start to ask questions around that. And there's tests and stuff that can help with that. But I think it starts with just asking the hard questions. And, and seeing how people behave. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's great insight. <laughs> we, have, we have a couple of positions open, so I'll be doing all of that. Ask those questions. <laughs> if everything <laughs> goes online tomorrow, what would you do, right? right. <laughs> Did you do in the past? Yeah. <laughs> Just wondering. All right, for both of you, I think that um, it's really helpful to understand about different ways of um, taking care of ourselves. Uh, in this time, I'm finding it really, really hard because. Um, I'm in this seat I, like 10, 12 hours a day, um, and that has been hard. So I've, I've started looking at my calendar and saying, I'm gonna do 45 minute meetings. <laughs> I just gotta get up and walk around because my, my brain and my back and my butt are totally tired. Um, so <laughs> I gotta work on that. But what, what advice do you have for us? Um, and, and Anifa, let's start with you. Just in terms of self-care, what are you doing these days? Um, and, and what are you doing personally? And what are you doing for your environment? Sort of your physical environment. Um, so I'm really into skincare. So I've been like um, 
you know, doing more on my skincare and actually taking longer. Like I'll have like a wine night and light some candles and do like, you know, my skincare routine. And also going outside, like going for a run or a walk, like being in nature is also very helpful for your mental health. And in terms of my environment, I'm actually like, um, I might do du apartment and i'm alone so like during the week i'll be here and then i'll go home um, on the weekends so being able to complete all my work while i'm at school and then also going home to like check out my family and be with them for the weekend has been really helpful for me yeah i want i want anifa's uh, skincare regime so i do too <laughs> so um, I keep looking you, for filters that, that make yes, it look like I have one. Blur your face. That would be a great addition, Zoom. Um, so anyway, no, I think for me, I've, I've, I've also done some of those. I think taking walks is really important. I've tried to do that a couple different times a day. I've also literally just changed rooms in the house. That seems to at least provide a little um, levity for me. I know this last weekend, and my family can attest to that, um, like I had worked literally, I don't even know, 12, 15 hour days for like a month straight. And on Saturday, I was like, I just need to sit in my room and watch like binge TV and and just not really interact with anyone and try to get my bearings again and, and not work, right? was most important. And I'm a very extroverted person as you might be able to tell. And I just needed quiet time where I could focus on someone else's life and not mine. And that was really helpful. And I have to say, I reemerged from the room I was like, okay, it's going to be okay. You know, <laughs> and then I went and took a nice big bubble bath. So are you going to tell us what you watched? Oh, I was finishing up Game of Thrones and don't tell me how it ends. Cause I still have three episodes left. So <laughs> I'm finally catching up. So, um, but I, I think everyone's looks different, but I think having some variety, having a, a mix of sitting and exercising and, and talking with people. I know I've been FaceTiming with my dad um, and interacting in different ways. And I, I think that's going to be important. So got to find what feels good. Ooh, Tiger King. I want to see that, Pam. Oh, yeah. Somebody, oh, Tiger King and Love is Blind. There's so many. More big TV in my future. Yeah. <laughs> yes. so. I actually really resent people who, who turn me on to shows because I, um, I have no ability to turn Netflix off. It's like next, next show starting Ooh, in three seconds. And I'm like, oh. skip the intro. I know. I know. I mean, I, I can really get into a marathon. Um, so I just have one last question for you. Uh, we're hearing a lot about just, just faculty staff, um, who have children and are trying to manage the, the school at home who don't have childcare in the home, maybe don't have big spaces. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to figure out how do we support them? So I'm curious about, about that. Yeah, I, I think it's super hard. I mean, I think trying to find defined schedules every day is really helpful of who's gonna do what and try to piece together the puzzle of who's on what meeting, who's doing what studying, who needs quiet time and trying to carve out that space. I think um, I've seen a lot of uptick on headphones Right. If you have headphones and take tucking yourself away so that you can get some quiet time or you can hear a call a different way. Um, and, and then I think it's also OK. I know we've talked a lot with our employees about you need to tell us what your needs are. If, if you're doing homeschooling and you actually have to be online with your student from eight to twelve, um, that's fine. Maybe you extend your day and you work at nights for us. Right. And we want you to come to us and tell us what do you need and how can we try to accommodate that wherever feasible. Um, so I also think you have to have a voice for yourself to say, this is what I need to be successful, both for me personally, but also in my family situation where also maybe you're taking care of a sick loved one. Um, but I think it starts with transparency and saying, this is what I need to be successful and, and us being creative and open-minded to say, how can we support each other? So I think there's a lot of different things we can do, but we don't always ask and we don't always think creatively. Yeah. All right. Well, I will say that, um, when I get to build my own company in my next life, I want both of you to be on the leadership team. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I like to have the right people um, on my ex team. And I think that you two would be terrific in that way. Thank you so much for taking the time, Shannon. Um, this, is, this is a tough time to peel out and dedicate an hour. So um, I am so grateful. And it's always fun to just see you because you have such great energy. Um, and Anifa, same to you. It was fun to prepare with you yesterday. It's great to see you on screen today. And I hope that you have um, a, good, uh, a good rest of your week. And to everyone else, we will be back again next Thursday. Um, and we're having fun doing these webinars. Let us know what you would like um, to hear from us and, and who you'd like to hear from.
so we can have um, ideas that are coming from the community to serve the community. I uh, appreciate all of you and be well. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.